Hi, everyone. I'm Derry Dexheimer. Thanks a lot for joining us today for this TBS webinar. I hope it's really useful for everybody. Um, and we are hoping just to keep it pretty informal. So feel free to just drop any questions into the chat as we go along. We have a lot of TBS team members online here that can help answer questions. Um, and also just raise your hand and we have people um, looking for that. So if anybody raises their hand, Gabby, just give me a nudge and we'll we'll get their question answered. Um, but I'm Derry Dexheimer. I work here at Sandia National Labs. I'm the ARM TBS lead mentor. Um, and today we will be giving an overview of the TBS instrumentation and system. Um, the proposal opportunities for the TBS and the anticipated FY25 TBS operating locations. Uh, and then Gabby Whitson, uh, a team member here at Sandia on the TBS team will be giving an overview of TBS CAM and TBS DTS data sets. We'll have Jesse Kremian giving an IMP data overview, uh, Narun Nahar Lata from PNNL EMSL giving an overview of TBS data availability from EMSL. We'll have Paul Walter from St. Edwards University uh, give a presentation on tracer ozone sound data. We'll have Chang'ai Kuang from Brookhaven um, present on one nanometer CPC data from tracer and SGP. Um, Lindsay Yi from UC Berkeley will be presenting on VOC sampling that we recently conducted at SGP. And then Dan Feldman from Lawrence Berkeley and Allison Aiken from Los Alamos will be discussing stale aerosol data and airborne imaging. And then Maria Zavadovich from Brookhaven will be presenting on SAIL, FPOPs, and OPC data. So hopefully it will be a useful day for everybody. Uh, and then just some um, quick introductions to our team. Uh, I'm Derry Dexheimer, I'm the TBS lead. Casey Longbottom is our engineering lead. Uh, Gabby Whitson, who will be speaking after me, um, provides all of our camera operations support and um, a lot of the monthly reporting for ARM. Chris Vihill provides some engineering support and is our uh, renewable energy expert. Dennis DeSmet um, also provides engineering support and is our electrical safety advisor. Carlos Ruiz uh, started out as a mechanical engineering student intern and is transitioning into a full-time role on the team, um, supporting our engineering efforts. And then Tristan Zimmer and Ben Hess uh, provide a lot of support for our field in operations uh, and our 3D printing efforts. Brent Peterson um, provides a lot of our, our camera support in the field. And then Matt Tizak and Steve Storch are part-time uh, members that help us out um, with our aerosol instrumentation and on our flight crews. And then Taylor Sedaseri is our DTS associate mentor. So if you have done any TBS activities um, with us in the field, you've probably met a lot of these folks or hopefully if you plan to propose something, you will be meeting them. In the okay, so to start off, um, just some technical specifications about the TBS. If you haven't used it before and aren't really familiar with it, so on this image here, the balloon is actually up here in space. Um, and then these three what we call apex lines that are kind of in this pyramid shape here are the load bearing lines for the balloon. Uh, and then we have four handling lines that the actual TBS crew members um, use to launch and retrieve the balloon. So we'll physically grab onto those and that's what uh, launches the balloon off or onto the trailer. Then this is our, our payload space where all of the guest instrumentation will normally be riding on the tether. This is the severe terminal end of the tether um, and the balloon generally performs best if the instruments are located as close to that point as possible. Um, it is possible to, to put um, instruments at other places on the tether. For instance, sometimes we'll put a pops here towards the balloon and then it pops like somewhere halfway on the tether, but you generally don't want to put anything like extremely heavy, um, much lower down from the balloon than this. Um, then this is the actual tether itself. And then this is our distributed temperature sensing fiber that runs along the tether and is just clipped 
um, to the tether at increments. Uh, and then this is the winch that's doing all the work, spooling and unspooling the tether. So the diameter is about uh, 22 feet on the inflated balloon. The height's about 14 and a half feet. Um, it takes about 15 of those large hel helium cylinders to fill. Um, the calm wind lift uh, at sea level is about 158 pounds, and we have about 75 pounds of payload capacity that we can use of that. So that just allows us um, a safe margin with all the weight of the tether um, and all the flagging and aviation lighting that we have to include on the balloon. Um, if we want to launch the balloon from any kind of higher altitude or even just as we go up in the atmosphere, we lose about 3% of lift per 1,000 feet that the balloon is operating above sea level. Our typical maximum flight altitude is about 1.5 kilometers outside of restricted airspace. Um, so the tether is descending up and down at a maximum rate of about 0.5 meters per second. We generally don't fly the, the balloon in winds aloft of over 14 meters per second, and we generally don't launch or retrieve the balloon in over 10 meters per second. Um, if you're trying to figure out where you could put the balloon, we need typically about 130 square feet of operating space. Um, and that's primarily because we have to be able to turn this truck and trailer into the wind. Um, so we have to be able to execute a full radius of turn with that system. The balloon does operate with an ADSB out transponder. Uh, we're currently able to uh, conduct night flights, as you can see in this picture here at SGP. Um, other flights could potentially also um, be allowed for night flights, uh, but we haven't pursued those permissions yet. And there are five TBS winch systems total, and three of those are dedicated to ARM. Uh, so just to go into a little more detail about the TBS flight operations and how those work. So the missions are typically about 14 days in length, and it takes us about one to two days um, to set that up at the beginning of the mission. Like if it's somewhere that we've been operating a lot, like at SGP, it might only take us half a day. Um, but if it's a whole new site, like say the upcoming Courage deployment, that will probably take a full two days for us to set up the first time. Uh, in uh, this coming year, ARM TBS is planned to operate at SGP in February, June, September, and October. And ARM is planning to fly six to eight total TBS missions during FY 2025. So outside of restricted airspace, um, generally the TBS is not allowed to operate within clouds. So the balloon has to remain at least 500 feet below cloud base. Uh, and you typically need that restricted airspace to, to do any kind of in-cloud flight activity. Then an, an individual flight may last anywhere from two to eight hours. So most flight days, we're generally operating um, three to five flights throughout a day. And those flights are generally like two to three hours in duration. So the balloon can go up to a desired altitude and just maintain there. Um, like it could fly there for anywhere from six to eight hours, depending on generally how long the batteries on the instrument will last, or it can just ascend and descend um, to the maximum potential altitude, uh, which we call that profiling. So a round trip flight to 1.5 kilometers typically requires almost two hours. Um, so that's with the balloon ascending and descending at that 0.5 meters per second. And sighting a TBS, um, it generally takes a little bit of time to get that going, uh, just because we have to uh, get a land lease in place, um, then we have to pursue the FAA approvals. Then there are processes within the laboratory um, for our aviation safety approvals. Then we have to get uh, NEPA approvals and US Fish and Wildlife Service consultations for the area where we're operating to make sure we're not gonna be impacting any wildlife adversely. Um, then we have to look at any flight hazards such as power lines, downwind structures, like adjacent highways, if it's a really um, congested or busy area under the balloon, uh, the logistics of getting helium into and out of the site. Um, so that requires like a large delivery truck and generally a forklift to offload those cylinders. Then where will the inflated balloon be stored? 
Um, so typically we house that in like a, a temporary hangar structure that we will, that arm will install as part of the campaign. Um, and then we also have to deconflict that with any radio sons or other aerial assets that are participating in the campaign. And this table here um, gives an overview of, of everywhere that arm has collected TBS data. So if you're trying to to find that data, this might be a helpful column because um, sometimes it's kind of difficult to figure out what site indicator um, the TBS was at uh, as part of one of these campaigns. So for example, for Tracer, the TBS was operating at the S3 site. And then for sale, um, we initially operated at the M1 site and then moved to the S4 location. And typically at SGP, we're at the main site, with, which is designated by C1. Um, okay, so to get into the proposal paths, I know this is a, a little confusing and a lot of people um, have questions about this. I think Gabby is going to be posting um, a PDF of this flowchart uh, in the chat. And if you guys have any questions, please reach out to me or Andy Glenn, and we're happy to help walk you through this process. Um, but really, it the initial question is, are you requesting a whole new TBS campaign or are you just requesting to add on to an already approved TBS mission? Um, so if you just have an instrument that you want to ride along um, on an already approved TBS mission, it can be a pretty straightforward, easy um, approval path uh, where you can just propose um, to the small campaign request form within ARM. Um, if you do require any of the FICUS instrumentation, so that's all of the, the EMSL instruments and analysis, so all of the, the samplers, then you would need to submit a separate ARM FICUS proposal request. Um, so it, the two main questions are, are you trying to piggyback onto an already approved campaign and do you or do you not need uh, FICUS instrumentation. Um, and that'll really define your path along this process. So a little more detail on that. So the, the MSOL analysis of aerosol particle properties and VOC sampling, if you need this, um, that this will, the QR code will take you to that FICUS proposal page. Um, the call is open. The letters of intent are due on February 8th. Um, and then the full proposals will be due on April 2nd. And those projects, if approved, can start on October 1st. So within FICUS, you can propose to analyze samples from any of the past TBS missions. So that includes Tracer, SGP, and SAIL, or any of these upcoming SGP TBS missions that we'll be conducting in FY24, um, or any FY25 new TBS deployments that you would be proposing to this call. Um, so the eligible FY25 TBS deployment locations include SGP, BNF, uh, which is uh, ARM's new facility in Alabama, or the Courage Kent Island site. So an important thing to note about these FICUS proposals, um, if you need any of the non-FICUS ARM TBS instruments, please go ahead and include those in the FICUS proposal. Um, so those would be anything like wind speed, wind direction, the POPs, the CPC, the distributed temperature sensing, anything that is not specifically an EMSL instrument, um, go ahead and list that in your FICUS proposal, uh, just so ARM can maintain awareness about uh, all the instruments that are being proposed. So if you don't require the EMSL instruments or any sample analysis, you can just go through the ARM TBS proposal path. Um, that has a very similar timeline. Those pre-proposals are also due on February 8th. Um, the full proposals are due on March 31st, and then those projects can start uh, probably slightly earlier on September 1st. This QR code will take you right to the RMTBS proposal page. Um, it's the same three uh, eligible locations for FY25 uh, RMTBS deployments. So that's the SGP, the BNF, and the Courage Kent Island site. We do anticipate um, that the BNF location uh, flights will not be able to start there until March 2025 because we're waiting on some trees to be cleared. Um, that's the information as we know it right now. That might change. Um, you can also go ahead and uh, submit any small campaign request 
to ARM. Um, if you miss this proposal path, um, you can still submit a small campaign request to jump on any of the missions that are, are going to be taking place at these locations. And those small campaign requests are uh, reviewed quarterly. Um, and we are working to facilitate NSA being an eligible location for next year's ARM TBS call, because uh, I know a lot of you have some questions about that. Um, so just to give a little more information on this, this is the location at SGP. I saw there were some questions in the chat. So this is the, the site in Oklahoma ARMS um, main facility. And we operate, if you have been to SGP, we're at the 50 pad, um, which is on the extreme southern end of the site. You may not even know it's down there um, if you've never actually been to the TBS operating location. Uh, and then the TBS will be operating here on the extreme southern tip of Kent Island uh, as part of Courage. Um, and then at the BNF site uh, in Alabama, we'll be operating here at the main site at the AMF, um, directly south of where the AMF instrumentation will be. Um, so here's a link to that small campaign request process that I mentioned. Um, so if you are going to be submitting to that, just keep in mind that uh, ARM reviews those on a roughly a quarterly basis. So just try to get those in about three months before um, you'd like to start your project. Um, and otherwise, the two primary call paths are highlighted here. So again, those are due, the letters of intent or pre-proposals are due on February 8th. Um, and then those decisions will be sent in July. Hopefully, I answered some of those questions. Um, Okay, so going into uh, ARM TBS instruments, this will take you to the ARM TBS baseline instrument page where all of this information is detailed. And again, you know, please reach out to us if you have any questions about it. We have six POPs units. Um, we have six uh, alcohol-based CPCs. The stack and the TBAC, which I think um, Naroon will be speaking in more detail about, are considered baseline instruments with any of those ARM ficus proposals. Um, they, uh, EMSL also has cascade impactors that we typically operate at the surface as part of TBS ficus missions. Um, so we'll operate those diurnally. So one will run continuously during the day uh, and one will operate during the night. Um, then we have a microeth AE51 for uh, black carbon concentration uh, measured at one wavelength. We typically operate that continuously at the surface um, during TBS flights. And then we have the MA200, um, which is measuring at five different wavelengths. Uh, that's a black carbon measurement. And we typically are operating that uh, in flight. So that's an airborne instrument um, during TBS operations. Then all of our atmospheric state instrumentation, um, those would be all of the, the radio songs. So that's where we derive like pressure, temperature, relative humidity, and the 3D GPS. Um, the IMET XQ2 is basically another version of that radio sound. We do have one hertz um, horizontal wind speed that's provided by cup anemometers. Uh, we have one hertz wind direction that is provided by um, GNSS antennas that are spaced apart um, on a one meter long boom. Um, then we get a vertical component of wind velocity with a vertical cup anemometer. Um, this is all typically part of the baseline package that we'll be operating on any TBS mission. We have recently developed a 60 hertz 3D sonic wind speed uh, airborne sensor. We are working to develop a TKE product from that. Um, so right now that's available upon request. And currently we just have the 60 hertz uh, raw 3D wind speed data. Um, we also have two DTS systems. That's a, a Celixa and a SensorNet DTS system. Um, we typically use the Celixa whenever we can because it has slightly improved spatial resolution. Uh, and then anytime we're conducting a TBS operation, we have this TBS ground station that's continuously operating at the surface. So that's providing us one hertz temperature, relative humidity, pressure, uh, and wind speed. Um, if you're looking for like a gust wind speed measurement, the TBS ground station is a good source for that. Um, and again, that's operated generally continuously everywhere that the TBS goes. Uh, and then going into our gas phase instruments, we have the FROST, uh, which is a Sandia developed VOC sampler 
that is available upon request. Um, so if you have interest in that, just be sure that you uh, mention that in your proposal uh, so we can incorporate um, the costs associated with that, that instrument uh, into our uh, analysis of the proposal. Uh, then EMSL also has a version of a VOC sampler called the Travis. That's debuting this year. Um, that is a new baseline instrument with EMSL. Um, so the, the Travis can also be requested as part of your FICUS proposal. And there are two Travis instruments. Um, so in theory, you could propose to operate one aloft and operate one at the surface. Um, and then there's also this frost sampler that could be operating somewhere else on the tether that could be thrown into the mix. Um, and then we have several ozone songs that are available upon request. Gabby, speaking after me, will go over a lot of our camera uh, instruments in more detail, but we do have two thermal imagers. The most sensitive of those is this cooled midwave infrared imager called the Mirage. Uh, and then when we are able to conduct in-cloud flights, we have supercooled liquid water songs, a video ice particle sampler, and then generally everywhere the TBS operates, there will be a solometer, um, and that's to provide us information on the cloud base, and it provides a uh, real-time uh, measurement of the mixing layer height. Um, so that's really helpful for uh, analyzing our aerosol measurements uh, after the flight as well. So to go into the data a little bit, um, this will take you to a PDF that describes the TBS merged VAP in more detail. Um, but that's this TBS merged VAP is really kind of your, your one file where almost all of the baseline TBS data is going to be located. Um, so all of these different individual data streams can be downloaded individually. Um, from ARM data discovery. But the nice thing about TBS merged is ARM has already done the work to put all of those into one file uh, and synchronize the timestamps and synchronize the altitudes. Um, so it's going to be a lot easier for you to use as a user. And it does include the TBS ground measurement, um, the TBS POPs data. So that's the total concentra concentration and then the size distribution. The TBS TBS CPC, which is a total concentration. Um, and then the, the IMET data, the TBS wind data. So that will be the wind speed, the wind direction, and your vertical wind speed will be included in that. And then your cloud base height and boundary layer height from the solometer are all included um, in TBS merged. So just a little demonstration of how to get this up data discovery. Um, so just go to this data, data search page uh, if you're looking for it, say TBS merge from SGP, just type SGP TBS merged in. Um, then you can get uh, more details on the actual dates of the data that are available um, and all of the different instruments included in that measurement. Uh, and then another useful thing uh, for you guys, uh, if you're looking for reports or, or any kind of um, data about what operated on a specific day in a TBS flight, or how do you know um, what flights your instrument went on that day. During the, the flight campaigns, we will send out uh, an email at the end of each day discussing the flights. Uh, that includes the flight report, but if you miss some of those in your emails or you know you need a repository of of everything that happened that day, the ARM TBS campaign dashboard is a great place to look for that stuff. Um, you can view the daily TBS campaign reports. Um, where there, ARM is also uh, creating an updated dashboard that will include um, a lot more data about the TBS itself, including um, calibration reports and maintenance reports of the TBS. Uh, but a little demonstration of how uh, you can look up past reports. Let's say you're trying to find a sale report. Um, so what operated that day on the TBS, um, go ahead and look for either Gabby or I's name as the submitter, and then just look for the date that you're interested in. Um, so here we're gonna be downloading April 10th, 2023 as our report. You'll get the whole Word file downloaded to your computer. Um, then you can open that up 
and that will have um, detailed information about uh, the instruments that flew that day, um, the flight conditions that we observed, um, the actual activity of the TBS. So here we conducted a profile and then a second profile, um, and that'll give you information about the maximum flight altitude um, and the times of the flight. Uh, and then it will give you some quick look plots uh, from the POPs and CPC of what was observed that day. Um, so these will be included in each of those daily reports. And this, um, these larger scatter dots here indicate the concentration from the POPs. Um, and then these smaller dots uh, indicate uh, concentrations from an F POPs or a CPC is indicated in this chart here. Um, and then we also will have a plots of the size distribution of the particle diameters um, will include anything of interest that might have been operating on that flight day in these quick looks. So that could include uh, ozone data, um, wind speed data, anything kind of, of particular interest that happened. Um, I see Chongai has asked, is a Doppler LiDAR part of the standard TBS deployment? Um, Typically, yes, there will be a Doppler LiDAR at most TBS sites. Um, it's not a for sure a guarantee at Tracer. Specifically, we did not have a Doppler LiDAR uh, operating at the um, ancillary site where the TBS was. Um, but I think going forward um, at Courage, I believe a Doppler LiDAR is planned to be operating at the Kemp Point site. Um, and there will be one, of course, at BNF. Hopefully that answered your question. Okay, just a little bit more detail quick about this, this TBS flight report and what it looks like. Um, this is a, an example of some uh, SGP flights that we just recently conducted last September. Um, so this is the larger dots in the background are the POPs concentration with the CPC in the front. Um, the blue background indicates when the TBS was operating during the day. So we conducted these two separate flights up to a kilometer during the day. And then at night, we conducted this flight up to about 1.25 kilometers. Um, this was just kind of a, an interesting case that we wanted to show. Um, so these boxes here indicate the stack impactors that were running um, at the times of flight. So we're kind of sampling over these little altitude increments. Um, and you can see that during flight two, the we started off in flight one with this really well mixed boundary layer. During flight two, our elevated CPC concentrations are kind of began to be confined um, to below 600 meters. Then after sunset, we really saw this very sharp um, residual layer here right around 600 meters. Um, this is a Doppler LiDAR shot from uh, 145, which is right around this time when stack impactor 13 was sampling. And you can see there's this really sharp shift uh, in wind direction from west to east and also this very sharp um, transition in wind speed. Also our real-time data from the salometer, um, we saw this uh, very abrupt decrease in the reported boundary layer height um, where we transitioned into this more stable nocturnal boundary layer. So it decreased from about 1800 to 180 meters um, very sharply. So this is a good way for you to identify maybe priority impactors from the stack or priority flights or times of data that you are interested in looking into further. Um, so this would be obviously an impactor of interest. Um, this uh, kind of 100 meter area of elevated concentrations, uh, which correlated to this particular stack impactor 13 and the, the valve three on the TBAC. Um, so that's just an example of how you can use these TBS flight reports to kind of go through and figure out what actually happened um, during the mission that you were flying on. Then last slide here, um, the, just going into a little more about upcoming potential locations. So at NSA, uh, the FAA has provided initial approvals for TBS flights up to 3,000 feet or 915 meters um, at the old Narl runway, if you guys are familiar with that area. So we definitely are not gonna be able to fly in clouds um, 
at NSA, but we are working with the Navy to lease this uh, 400 square foot area of operating space uh, and to utilize this existing Navy hangar to store the inflated balloon. Um, and then at ENA, uh, the RMTBS has been in the FA's queue for several months now, awaiting the issuance of end numbers. Once we get those end numbers issued, we're anticipating that to happen, hopefully in February at the latest March. Um, then we can begin to uh, work with the Portuguese aviation authorities on flight permissions for ENA. Um, and I see Gabby has answered Janet's questions. I think that's all I have. Uh, if anybody else has questions. Just real quick, uh, what is NSA and ENA? Uh, so NSA is North Slope, Alaska. Uh, so that's on the extreme northern edge of Alaska. If you put that into the ARM website, it'll it'll bring you up a map of exactly um, where that's located. And then ENA is ARM's other um, fixed facility. Uh, Eastern North Atlantic uh, in the Azores. Thanks. Sure. So this is Joe Fernando. What's the what's the possibility that FY twenty six we have the NSA site? I think it's pretty likely, Joe. I mean, okay. we're definitely working hard on it. You know, you can imagine it's kind of a long path to to get the Navy and Sandia into consensus on a land lease, but I'm pretty optimistic that we'll make it. All right, thank you. Sure. And also you said that uh, FY25, you can request some uh, processing of the previous data you took, we took um, from TBS. Yes, um, I don't, Narun, do you know if the Alictuk samples um, from back in 2020 are eligible for that call? I'm not sure, Joe, I can find out. I don't, I'm not exactly positive if um, there's still enough remaining of those electoc samples that you can propose on those, but I'll find out on Thank that. Thank you, yeah. Thank you very much. Great, with that, I will turn it over to Gabby. All right, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Gabby. Now, can you see my slides? Yep, we're, we're looking at, you're not in presenter view, um, but we're, yep, there you go, perfect. All right, um, so hi everybody, I am Gabrielle Whitson, or Gabby for short. I am the TBS Associate Instrument Mentor, and I'm just going to go through a quick demonstration on finding some of um, the TBS's additional data products and data discovery. Um, so these additional data products are the TBS CAM data stream and the TBS DTS data stream. So the TBS CAM is um, our data product for cameras operating on board the TBS. Um, the, this camera system has a visible and an infrared camera attached to it um, from a gimbal platform that is affixed to the balloon. Uh, the data product currently features images taken in support of the sale campaign in Crested Butte, Colorado. And the TBS DTS data product is our distributed temperature sensing data. Uh, collected using either the Selixa or SensorNet DTS systems. Um, the data provides high re resolution temperature data um, every about half meter between the surface and the balloon. Um, this data product currently features data sets collected during the tracer campaign and campaigns at SGP. Um, so I'm just going to go into a quick live demonstration on finding this data and data discovery. So a good rule of thumb to find TBS data is just to type in TBS and you'll see uh, a bunch of our data products and data streams here. 
um, but I am going to go ahead and search for the TBS CAM data stream. Oh, it didn't pop up. All right. Um, so our TBS CAM data stream is housed in the ARM uh, ILP area. So I'll just hit confirm and it'll take me to that site. Um, and here you will find all of um, our data products for this data stream and some important information. So here on the overview, um, you will find all of the data information, including how uh, the files are named, um, how the directory is organized and the purpose of the data. Uh, this can also be found here in this readme file if you'd like to see it in a different format. Um, so you'll see that our uh, data products are organized by the date that they were captured and then the site that we captured them at. So for sale, we operated at the M1 site, which was the main site for a period of time. And then we switched to the supplemental site four, um, which was at the Mount Crested Butte pump house. Um, so going further into these files, you'll see that we have them organized by the date that they were taken. Um, so I'm just gonna open up April 6th and you'll see all of the data files that are included in this data set. Um, so the CSV files are all of the raw data, raw data collected for the infrared images. And then scrolling down, you'll see some of our image sets. So the R10C images are our visible images and the MWIR images are the middle wave infrared images that are captured. Um, and the most valuable part of each camera data set is the report that is generated. Um, and these reports typically contain all of the metadata for our image sets and will show both the infrared image and the visible image side by side. So I'll let this load. So yeah, so here's our report that is generated um, and it'll have each image taken during that session um, and it'll show the timestamp, the altitude at which the balloon was at, our estimated emissivity, ambient, ambient temperature and humidity, and then our GPS latitude, longitude, altitude and heading. Um, so that's it for the TBS cam. Now I will do a short demonstration to find some of our TBS DTS data. Um, so when you type in TBS DTS, you have the option between channel one and channel two. Um, the channel one data is the data taken when the balloon is actively ascending and descending and channel two data is typically loitering data. Um, so when you're in data discovery, you can view all the details of the data stream, um, where, where the data was collected, when it was collected, and you can even visualize the data to see some of the plots that are created through the uh, DQ plotter. So that's our DTS data for this specific flight. And then just going back, I did include some images of our camera system in action. So you'll see here, this is our Mirage 640 infrared imager. And then we have a Sony camera that acts as our visible camera um, on the gimbal system that is attached to a plate uh, affixed to the balloon here. And then this is our DTS in action. So we have this, this fiber spooler um, that we run and attached to the tether as Derry mentioned earlier. And then just some contacts uh, if you're interested in 
these specific data streams, you can contact these people. And that's pretty much it from me. Great. Thanks, Gabby. Um, unless we have any questions, I think, Jesse, we are ready for you. Okay. okay. Can everybody see the slide there? Yep. It looks good in your presenter view. All right. Perfect. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to talk briefly about um, some of our INP or ice nucleating particle mentor measurements. So uh, pictured here is our INP mentor team. So we have myself and Tom Hill, our co-mentors, and then Carson and Tim that are associate mentors. And so we're um, a little unusual. We're not based at a um, DOE national lab, but we're at, out of Colorado State University. Um, and so Derry and Gabby gave some nice um, background on the balloon system, but what we do specifically is we collect IMP race nucleating particle measurements at a number of different arm sites on the ground, but we also do it um, on the tethered balloon system. And so we have this instrument called the ice puck. It is a um, basically a miniaturized time resolved sampler. Um, it's a prototype from Handex Scientific. And what it does is it has these cartridges that has filters that we put in it. So we can collect up to eight filters, typically for the duration of these tethered balloon flights, we'll collect anywhere from one to three filters at different vertical levels so that we can actually look at vertically resolved ice nucleating particle concentration measurements. So typically what we use to process these samples is we use the instrument called the ice nucleation spectrometer or INS. These are some pictures of what it looks like at our um, DOE lab here at our specific DOE lab room, I should say, at Colorado State University. And this top image is showing basically um, what it looks like inside. So how that works is we take the filters that we collect from either the ground or the tethered balloon ice puck sampler. We suspend them in ultra pure water. We create these droplet arrays of, of different sample types. And then basically we step down the temperature of the system to see these wells freeze. And how these wells freeze depends on the number and the types of ice nucleating particles that are in these different samples. So just a brief overview, if you want more details, please feel free to check out our ice nucleation spectrometer handbook, which is on our instrument page through the DOE ARM website. We also do different types of treatments on the samples to be able to give us information on what types of IMPs might be present. So basically what we get from these different analyses is a cumulative IMP spectra. So this is showing an example of the data that we can provide from these samples. On the bottom axis is basically cloud freezing temperature, or freezing temperature that's measured in the instrument. And on the left axis is the number concentration of IMPs per standard liter of, of air. This black spectrum is showing an example of just untreated total IMPs per sample. And then when we apply these different treatments, you'll see a drop typically in the IMP spectra. And that gives us some information on the types of IMPs that are there. So for example, this heat treatment can give us some information on the biological derived IMPs that are there. So these are things that are heat labile like proteins. The peroxide treatment gives us some information on the organic INPs that are present. And then whatever we have left over are typically organic INPs, which can be things like mineral dust. Okay, pretty brief overview on the methods, but if you want, if you need more details, feel free to reach out to me. Also on our instrument page, we have a very detailed filter log from all of our ground base and tethered balloon system sites. And so you can actually go to our fly filter log. We update this pretty regularly to see what sites we've been to, what TBS deployments we've done. Anything with box green indicates data that are available on that DOE archive that both Derry and Gabby talked about. Anything in yellow are where we have had deployments and we have samples and we are working on finalizing the data to post publicly. And then anything in red are samples that we have collected but we have not yet um, analyzed on our ice nucleation spectrometer. So since this is a TBS call, we have a number of deployments um, and actually on the DOE ARM archive, we do have some TBS data available for the study that was called AG and SGP. So that's an IOP or intensive operating period that was led by Susanna Burroughs. And we had some balloon measurements during the month of April, 2022. And those data, if you just look for TBS INP, you'll find the data from that study. And we're working on getting all of the SAIL deployments um, up on the archive. 
So here's just some examples of IOP projects that involved the ice puck or looking at IMPs vertically on the tethered balloon system. So again, Susanna Burroughs study, there's a number of different um, IOPs that were led by different PIs for the sale campaign. And then also um, we have a DOE atmospheric systems research project led by Russell Perkins that's looking at IMPs during sale, which will include analysis of some of those TBS measurements. So um, there's already been a lot of discussion on the upcoming campaigns. These dates are showing the actual deployments of our ground-based measurements, but there will be flights, um, as Derry had mentioned, at these different locations that you can request the ice puck to be deployed on. And Derry already went through the information of how to actually request that instrument. So you can either go through the ficus, you could probably ask for it there, or just the standard um, asking for the ARM small field campaign request. Just to give you some examples from sale of what we can provide, here are some spectra from the one of the flights in July of, I believe, 2023. The black spectrum is what was measured at the ground, so at the aerosol observing system on Mount Crested Butte. And then the blue and green spectra are the IMPs that were collected on the tethered balloon at different altitude ranges and during different days. So you can see that they line up pretty nicely with what was measured on the ground, but maybe dropped a little bit as we went up with height. So IMPs were typically lower above or below about minus 15 C, but increasing altitude with increasing altitude, typically within the uncertainty. Here's another example of some of the treatments that I talked about. So we can give you information on IMP types. Here is an example from that July 26, sorry, that was 2022, um, where we have the untreated sample in the black spectrum, and then the red spectrum is showing the heat treated sample. Going up a little higher, so from 250 to 500 meters, the untreated here in gray, and then the treated sample in pink shows you that we had lower concentrations aloft, and we still had that biological presence there because we did see a drop from that treatment. However, it's not always the case where we see these types of changes with altitude and with the treatments. So, for example, the following day, we didn't really see a large drop with treatment, indicating that there weren't really any sort of biological IMPs that were present. And going up in altitude, we didn't see a whole lot of changes either, and we saw spectra that were similar to what we observed from the 0 to 250 meter sample. So some of these days can have an IMP decrease with height, some of them have biological IMPs, and some we don't really see any changes. Um, we don't look into it scientifically, we just provide the data depending on what, what's requested from, from you all. So I'll just give this up here, you can scan these links to get to our instrument page or the data discovery to look up our data and my emails there in case you have any questions. Um, you can reach out to myself or if they're TBS specific, you can also reach out to Derry. And that is all I have. Perfect, thanks. If we don't have any questions for, for Jesse, I think we can move on to Narun Nahar. I see um, it looks like Nuru Nahar is having some audio difficulty. She and I will be presenting some of the EMSL stuff together. So uh, maybe while she's getting that sorted. Um, uh, Nuru Nahar, can you type in the message if you're able to share a screen? Otherwise, I can share the presentation as well. Nice, there it is. Uh, Narun Nahar, do you want me to do my stuff first? That gives you a chance to. Yeah, I can. Out the audio. I, ah, I, I, there we go. Nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Go for Hi, it. I'm Narun Nahar Lata. Uh, I'm a postdoc working at M Environmental Molecular Science Laboratory. Uh, today, um, I and Greg, uh, Gregory Vandergift will present uh, the characterization of atmospheric particles uh, by microscopy and mass spectrometry capabilities at EMSL. Uh, so, Uh, I, I'm, I'm not able to change the slide. Did 
there is some difficulty still not able to change the slide. You might try uh, unsharing and then resharing. Yes. So at EMSO, we have um, several research capabilities uh, for sampling of aerosol. Um, so the sampling is done based on, uh, with the uh, stack, which is size and time resolved aerosol collection device. And next, uh, for analysis, uh, we can, uh, for analyzing the aerosol, we have several uh, high resolution mi uh, microscopy and mass spectrometry capabilities. Uh, so for uh, microscopy, we have ACM, TEM, AFM, and for uh, doing the mass spectrometry analysis, we have high resolution uh, uh, mass spectrometry capabilities like NanoDZ, FDICR, mini splat, and for multi omics analysis. So now, uh, why we are uh, showing this? Because we wanted to know, like, uh, know the community, like uh, how we can make the best use of this capabilities for the next call to support plan activities in the SGP, BNF, and courage location. And I would like to remind you that uh, the, uh, we have a, a, a several proposal call open, armed EMSL proposal, and also larger scale proposal. So if you wanted to uh, know more about the proposal detail, you can visit this link. So I wanted to show the uh, our EMSL uh, emerging capability, uh, which is a uh, size and time resolved aerosol collector. So this is the uh, um, uh, uh, image where we can see that the, the stack collector, the aerosol collector. So a stack gives us the uh, size and time resolved aerosol. And this stack is not only an aerosol collection device, it, it can also provide us the uh, real-time measurement of the temperature uh, because it has some environmental sensor and it can give us the relative humidity and also the altitude information. So with, uh, with the stack uh, capability, um, there is an optical particle counter uh, is connected uh, so that it can uh, measure the particle size distribution uh, when uh, it is sampling the aerosol uh, with the tether balloon. And it also have a MA200 ethylometer, uh, which uh, to give the particle uh, light absorption properties, uh, for example, the black carbon concentration in the atmosphere. So this is the um, schematic of the stack uh, impactor. Uh, so this stack device can uh, accommodate 20 impactors so that we can uh, sample aerosol particles at multiple different altitudes. So we can um, collect aerosol at multiple different altitudes. So if you wanted to learn more about the stack impactor, uh, you can read this paper by Cheng et al., which is published in uh, Environmental Size Atmosphere. Atmosphere. So let's see, what are the analyses? What are data we can uh, get from the uh, stack collected sample? So uh, STAC gives us the size-resolved and time-resolved aerosol particles, and this can be analyzed with our several capabilities available at EMSL. So it can be analyzed with the um, EMSL's uh, capabilities, uh, uh, computer control, ACM, coupled with energy dispersive X-ray. So this gives us the size, um, uh, size and also the morphology and also the chemical composition. So here you can see uh, we can get the uh, size resolved chemical composition. Here you can uh, see uh, a paper published in uh, 2023. Uh, we, we can get a, uh, more than 1,000 particle uh, chemical composition and morphology within few, few hours. Uh, so with a stack collector sample, we can also do the multi-phase chemistry and we can also probe the hygroscopicity of the particle. And uh, in a, in, on a stack collector samples, we can also probe the ice nucleation. Uh, so um, this ice nucleation stage is fitted inside the ACM chamber, and we can mimic the mixed mix phase and cirrus cloud condition uh, to uh, probe the ice nucleation of the single particle uh, that are collected with the stack. And uh, with the stack collector sample, uh, we can uh, do the morphological analysis using uh, High resolution TEM and um, yeah, and to get the surface chemistry of the particle, we can uh, yeah, use our um, uh, MCL capability uh, time of flight, uh, secondary and uh, uh, secondary imaging mass spectrometry, and also the X-ray photoelectron spectrometry. So 
I would like to highlight some of the uh, results from the stack collected sample. So these are the results from the um, uh, size resolved chemical composition of the particles during the tracer field campaign. And these samples are basically from uh, uh, June 3rd, 2022. And uh, here you can see the altitude, the, the top is showing the number of impactor collected. And, uh, and this uh, image shows the size resolved chemical composition. So from the uh, computer control ACM collected data, we classify the particles into several classes. You can see different, different color indicates different classes of the particle. And also this shows the uh, ACM image. Uh, that means the morphology of the particles collected at multiple different altitude. So, and this is the flight profile um, where we can see the POPs particle concentration is varying with altitude. And from this, we can see that the sulfate and carbonaceous particles are dominated at all the altitudes. And we can also see that the uh, size distribution of the size of uh, like sulfate particles are changing across altitude uh, because here we, we saw like um, uh, sulfate is almost dominated uh, uh, here in the larger size range and it shifted to more than uh, for, for, the, um, for the ground side, we, uh, like closer to the ground, we can see the size distribution is shifted to um, like very large size, more than uh, one micron size range. So this work is in collaboration with uh, University of Michigan, uh, Sanger National Lab and ARM. Uh, so now I wanted to um, highlight some of the work from the SAIL uh, field camp, TBS field campaign. And this work is in collaboration with um, um, Arm, uh, EMSL, Arm, uh, Colorado State University, Purdue University. Uh, so this uh, field campaign was done, um, uh, this, this typical flight is from uh, July 27th. Uh, so for this uh, um, study, uh, aerosol particles were collected at two different altitude. Um, and then it, it was analyzed with computer control ACM. Uh, so here is the size, size of chemical composition. Different color indicates the uh, different classes of the particles. And uh, this, uh, this, this is for the high altitude case and this is for the low altitude case. For the high altitude case, it shows uh, 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 by modality in size distribution, uh, where uh, both modes are dominated with carbonaceous. Uh, the high altitude sample also has higher uh, carbonaceous dust uh, than the low altitude case. And we also observe uh, low altitude case uh, contains a higher biological particle uh, concentration, uh, which is around uh, 1%. And here is the ACM image of the biological particles uh, that we observe. Now I wanted to highlight some of the uh, results from the black um, MA200, which is uh, which gives us the black carbon concentration. Uh, so uh, this work is from um, uh, in collaboration with uh, Michigan Tech University, and this work is led by Susan Matai et al. And the left top panel is showing the uh, variation of black carbon concentration uh, in each of the day, uh, which is uh, this these samples were collected uh, from SGP uh, 2022 field campaign, and here we can see the variation of black carbon concentration in each of the day. And the bottom panel shows the uh, variation of black carbon concentration as a function of altitude. And we can see clearly see that those are di really different and distinct. And the middle panel is showing the CPC, variation of CPC concentration um, in each of the day, and also um, the um, uh, variation of uh, CPC concentration as a function of altitude. And for the, the, the rightmost panel is showing the uh, variation of um, the uh, absorption coefficient at different wavelength as a function of altitude. And we can see a, a clear difference uh, for the different uh, wavelength. So now I would like to uh, give the floor to our, my other colleague, uh, Gregory Vanderkiff, to discuss more about the um, mass spectrometry measurements. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Nuhar. Um, and I just wanted to highlight some things that have already been mentioned by a couple people, but uh, as a reminder, um, all of these EMSL measurements uh, and capabilities, um, as demonstrated here, have been or are capable to be deployed with the ARM TBS systems. Um, and like Dari gave the overview at the very beginning, the most straightforward way to access this kind of information is through uh, what we call the FICUS proposal. Um, thank you to Chiang Kai for giving the proposal link in the chat, and Jay Cheng also provided some 
further details about the types of EMSL measurements that can be requested as part of these proposals. Um, but as always, um, please reach out to us if you have questions. In fact, it's preferred if you intend on writing these proposals to please reach out to us. We um, can help you craft the proposal uh, and make sure that it has the best shot at being funded. Um, so with that in mind, again, I wanted to shift from what Narun Nahar had said about microscopy to focus a little bit more on the mass spectrometry side of the measurements um, that we can do with the TBS system and ARM uh, collaboration in general. Um, so the first measurement I want to highlight is uh, the collection of size resolved particles from onboard the TBS, uh, which is shown on the left hand side, the impactor system, which is uh, the five stage Ceutis impactor in the middle. Um, and what this allows us to do is, uh, as the name is, implies, to collect size resolved particles, which we then take back to EMSL for offline analysis. Um, and for these low loading particles, our current method of choice is something called nanospray desorption electrospray ionization, or nanodesi for short. And that's interfaced directly with the high resolution mass spectrometer. So the image on the right hand side shows nanodesi in action. It's this about 50 micron uh, liquid junction um, that scans along this line of impacted aerosol, which is highlighted by this dotted red line for clarity. Um, so it's desorbed and ionized in one uh, step, allowing us to get high resolution mass spectrometry information. Um, next slide, please. Um, as Narun Nahar is um, getting that to advance, um, I'll highlight again, I'm going to talk a little, there we go. Um, so this is an example of what some of the more raw data looks like coming from this nanodesi high resolution mass spectrometry coupling. Um, and I'm showing that here for three days, April 17, 18, and 26, again, uh, collected from the SGP site. Um, and the mass spectra that you are looking at are for CHNO compounds on the top, uh, shown in blue, or CHO compounds. So these are molecules that contain exclusively combinations of those atoms. Um, but interestingly, what I've done here with the data is I've color coded it to show you molecular features that we only found in the sample that was collected with the balloon. We compared it with the sample that we also collected at ground level. Um, so you can see that April 17 has a lot more interesting things that are happening above this, this aloft level uh, compared to the other days. Um, and the interesting thing we found when comparing these and leveraging all the auxiliary data that's available with ARM, like Doppler LiDAR, et cetera, um, there was a lot more elevated relative humidity that was aloft on April 17 compared to the other two days. And there was also a cloud base that was on April 17 compared to the other two days. So there's a lot of interesting things that the mass spectrometry data can tell us about what's actually being transformed in these aerosols, which is then informed by the ARM data itself to get a better handle on what's actually changing from a meteorological standpoint. Um, next slide, please. Um, there we go. Um, so this is just another way of visualizing um, the data um, from the April 17th uh, case study. And again, this is an example of the kinds of data output that can be requested um, and part of these EMSL uh, arm ficus proposals. On the left is just simply a Van Crevelin diagram of the April 17 features. They're um, empty if they're universally detected between ground and aloft, but they're filled if we only found them in the aloft sample. And these more aloft molecular formulae we found had higher oxygen to carbon ratios, potentially indicating aqueous phase uh, transformations. Um, and on the right-hand side, we have a volatility on the y-axis and average carbon oxidation state on the x-axis. Uh, again, information that we're able to access uh, because of this molecular level data that we get by interfacing the nanodesi measurements with our high resolution mass spectrometry suite. Um, next slide, please. Um, another thing, the previous slide had highlighted the size resolved measurements. Um, we can also use the same kind of collection system that Narun Nahar highlighted, which is the stack or size and time resolved atmospheric uh, collection system for um, mass spectrometry characterization as well. Uh, we collected this at the sale site, actually at ground level, and this is also from these silicon nitride grids. We initially intended this for microscopy, uh, but as we got a better, better handle on our nanodesi mass spec methodology, we figured, hey, there's particles on this surface, let's give it a shot. Um, and it turns out that this direct sampling platform is sufficient enough for serendipitous mass spec data, even from these grids that were originally collected for, mass uh, for microscopy purposes, pardon me. Um, so this is just a representative sample that was collected at ground level using this stack platform. 
um, again, a mass spectrum on the left um, with different molecular classes corresponding to different colors. Um, and on the right hand side, we have a Van Krevelin diagram for that same sample. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is my last slide, um, at which point we can have questions or um, segue on to the next presenter. But the other thing I wanted to highlight, um, again, a type of sample collection facilitated by ARM that's compatible with our analysis is the time resolved bulk aerosol collector or TBAC. Um, this is um, data that, or samples rather, that was collected from the TBS system at sale. Um, so the top portion here, um, the TBAC uh, was collecting particles um, from 400 to 725 meters above ground level, whereas the bottom one is zero to 400 meters above ground level. Uh, and you can see in both cases, we're able to get sufficient particle loading um, to get highly informative and complex uh, mass spectrometry data where each of these distinct dots corresponds to assigned molecular formulae for an intact molecular feature. Um, so in each of these, there's thousands of features um, across a variety of different molecular classes. So depending on the kinds of research questions you have, maybe it's uh, volatility informed, maybe it's oxidation state informed, uh, maybe it's aromaticity. These are all questions that we can access and get information for through this uh, intact molecular level data uh, that we're accessing because of the way that uh, ARM has collected these samples. Um, so that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much and welcome any questions. Uh, I think we had a question from Fawn May in the chat, if you guys are able to respond to that. Yeah, so uh, um, the the primary expert on um, Fawn's question, and I'll read it out loud, uh, do we plan to archive these chemical analyses from EMSL through the ARM data center? There's a couple ways to answer this. The most simplest and uh, past the buck way of answering it is Saroop Chino will have the most information. Um, but the more um, explanation that I can give right now is EMSL's policy is that data is released one year after collection, at which point uh, I would say if you're aware of a project that used data, come talk with us uh, and we can see what we can do. Um, that's not a way of formally publishing the data, um, but there are intentions of eventually getting EMSL data available much in the same way that ARM has their data available in the data discovery portal, which is a very sophisticated and easy to use system. Clearly, we're a little bit ways away there from EMSL, but we see what ARM has been able to do with that data availability, and that's certainly our goal, even if it's not available um, at this point in time. Um, so the short answer would be, uh, please talk to any of us, particularly Swaroop, uh, and we can coordinate about getting that data available for your purposes. Great, thank you guys. Uh, unless there's other questions, I think we can move on to Paul Walter. Okay, um, so hopefully that's looking um, we're, okay. Paul, we're seeing um, your your view with your um, notes. Yeah. Hey, uh, let me try that again. And I assume that's still the case, right? Yeah, I don't know if there's a quick way to swap. Anyone else? <laughs> no. Yeah. If you can't get it, Paul, I think we can still see your slides well enough as is. Yeah, and then um, and with this one. So this is now just showing a PDF. Yeah, that um, looks great. Yeah, and there's a way to do full screen on that, but uh, Let it go. Okay. Um, so at any rate, um, so this is uh, tr overviewing the Tracer Tether Sond project, uh, where we had an ozone sond and a VOC sampler 
um, uh, as part of the payload at times uh, on the tethered balloon system during Tracer. Um, this is in collaboration with a number of folks from Baylor, University of Houston, and, and uh, Darius' team at, at Sandia. Um, and, okay, so um, in this uh, top left picture here, this shows the greater Houston area and the different tracer sites, a little faint there in yellow, but that's where the S3 ancillary site is near Guy, Texas, um, southwest of Houston in a rural area. Um, and this just shows an example of, we have an ozone sonde uh, as part of the payload and also this VOC sampler in this particular case. Um, thank you to the team there, um, the Tether Balloon uh, System team uh, for prepping the ozone sonds and Casey Longbottom kind of 3D printed a structure to hold the ozone sond um, and kind of help keep it cool where temperature with all things um, during Houston in the summer were, were part of the Part of the challenges. Um, so over about 40 different days between June and September, um, the, the ozone sonde was on the payload and uh, it's electrochemical cell ozone sonde. So every time an ozone molecule goes in and reacts in the cathode solution, a couple of electrons will flow from the anode to the cathode. Um, and so that'll be the baseline of, of, of our measurement there with ozone sonde. So ozone sonde was routinely on the payload. Um, and, and then uh, VOC sampler, I'll show that uh, on the next slide. That was on during six days in, in August um, and on 10 different profiles. Um, the Tiller balloon system operated for the first two weeks of each month. Um, and we had some days where the ozone sun was in there in June, but then the subsequent months it was generally on as part of the payload. This picture on the bottom right here gives an example um, where it's showing uh, the relative humidity in blue, um, where you can kind of see that as the... Uh, payload goes up as a as the balloon goes up that we transition from being in the boundary layer to being above the boundary layer um, at about 0.7 kilometers or so and uh, the plot is colored by um, by the ozone concentration and what that um, is just kind of showing is that it was distinct above and below the above the boundary layer and when you do high split back trajectories on those, we saw that there's really a difference in terms of where the air was coming from. So um, below in the boundary layer it was coming from the west and from the Gulf. Um, and above the boundary layer, it was coming from the Houston area. So that would kind of make some sense in terms of uh, higher ozone concentrations for air masses coming from that direction. This is a picture of the VOC sampler system um, uh, provided by uh, Megan Guganti um, at Baylor. Um, and she developed this in her in collaboration with her mentor, uh, Sasha Yusinko. And um, what it does is it collects samples um, using um, uh, resin tubes. And so, so then uh, it can collect up to four samples discreetly at a time, and it can be automated on uh, four samples on a particular profile, I would say. Um, and it can be automated where, um, in terms of when those samples are going to be collected. And then when a given sample is being collected, it'll take on the order of a minute or so um, while, while sampling there. Okay. Um, and this design was initially, they took it out to SGP for testing um, and, and uh, basically had to kind of work to get it better airflow uh, due to overheating, that, that kind of thing in the Houston area, as you can imagine. Uh, but, but that was uh, something they were able to work out and kind of test and iterate with over time uh, to get working uh, well during the Tracer campaign. Um, Okay, so then this slide kind of shows a, a number of things all together. 
Um, and the top panel and the bottom panel are both for the same flight, same profile, just different information in terms of what's being shown. And in red, it's just showing the altitude of the balloon and the payloads. Um, and in purple here, we have the ozone, which is kind of growing throughout the day just a little bit, not too high in terms of what that concentration is going to be. And then where you see these uh, particular kind of uh, bar chart showing up is that's from the VOC sampler. Uh, so different times where resin tubes were collected um, and what was the composition uh, of the VOC. So kind of giving you a sense of the total amount and the overall composition uh, of the VOCs for those. And what you can kind of see is that compared to in the morning, it changed a lot for this uh, uh, penultimate kind of profile near in the afternoon. Um, and the composition changed a fair amount. And also, if you look at the POPs data showing the total concentration number, um, that, that was distinctly different during this part of the day too. So the thought was it could be a possibility of a smoke plume that passed over the site uh, during that time. But uh, so, yeah, I wanted to show just a couple of different examples here uh, of the data and what data is available. I'll throw a link in the chat uh, to the project page here in just a second. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, that, that, that was what I was going to show for my slides. Interesting. Great. Thank you, Paul. Uh, and I think we're ready for Chungai. Okay. How do things look? Uh, looks good, and you're in presenter view. Okay, so uh, I'm just gonna skip to some of the highlight slides because I know we're running a little low on time. But uh, I just want to give an overview on some of the vertically resolved measurements down to one nanometer that uh, that the TBS team and I have made, and uh, give you some background, some data overview, and uh, some forward-looking type of considerations. So I'm going to skip the motivation and go directly to some information about this prototype CPC that was developed uh, in collaboration with aerosol dynamics. And so this was uh, essentially modified to measure down to one nanometer. And the reason why we pursued a CPC approach to measuring new particle formation on the TBS was because an SMPS is really too big and also creates some artifacts in the neutralizer. And that this system, uh, the CPC system was small enough and TBS ready enough uh, to be appropriate for making these types of measurements. So this is just an image of the CPC inside its enclosure. Uh, some aspects of the deployment. It was deployed at the Southern Great Plains in the years listed here. And um, I can also provide these slides uh, offline for you to look at as well. So we measured winter, spring, summer, and fall, not every year, but certainly providing some seasonal coverage throughout this time period. There were other collaborating campaigns uh, when these measurements were being made from Ellie Brown and CU and Cody Jen, Carnegie Mellon. And uh, so this site was certainly uh, certainly impacted by occasional biomass burning, but also frequent surface new particle formation. So it was an excellent opportunity to connect vertical measurements of NPF aloft with continued NPF events happening at the surface. Um, our tracer measurements included uh, around two weeks per month during the summer ILP. So two weeks in June, July, August, and September. Uh, a number of collaborating PIs, in, uh, including you know Paul Walter, who just gave a presentation, and also Maria Zavadovich, who will be presenting after me, also provide some context for other measurements at the ancillary site. So this is the rural site uh, that was made during Tracer. And at the Tracer site, you know we did see occasional biomass burning, occasional surface NPF, but also um, uh, considerations from sea breeze controls on the aerosol distribution as, as well as frequent convection. So some examples of the vertical result NPF profiles that we made at SGP are on the left. So again, showing the number of concentration uh, increasing once we reach above about 800, uh, 800 meters, uh, giving it, uh, evidence and indication of NPF occurring aloft. And then as we descend, we're also seeing again those increased concentrations, but then again, decreasing um, when we return to the surface. So some of the measurements and the example of measurements that can be made with this system uh, deployed on the TBS. And the image on the right is some uh, raw data from the tracer deployment. So showing some uh, measures of housekeeping on the top panel, 
in the middle panel showing the measured concentration along with the CPC ambient pressure. So the ambient pressure being a proxy for uh, sample altitude. So definitely showing some structure um, in total number of concentration uh, measured as the TBS is ascending and descending. And then for those who are very familiar with CPC operation, the bottom third panel shows the raw pulse height distribution from the CPC, giving some rough indication of size distribution characteristics measured from the CPC. So uh, these measurements will get, generally give you total number of concentration above different cut sizes uh, and at different time resolutions. And then uh, we're in the process of continuing QAQC uh, as we are um, kind of masking the data for CPC stability, and, uh, but then also for environmental conditions as well. And we'll just like to acknowledge scientific support from our um, joint SFA with Argonne and then just great deployment support from the ARM SGP staff, the Tracer staff, and also the Sandia TBS team. Thanks. Great, thank you, Chongai. Um, with that, I think we can move on to Lindsay. Hi, everybody. Let me just get my screen up. Okay, um, let me know if anything's unclear or if you can't see or hear me. So I'm gonna um, talk about some very brief highlights of the VOC, the volatile organic compound and semi-volatile organic compound initial results from our flights in September on board the TBS. Um, I work at UC Berkeley with Alan Goldstein and I really appreciate um, Jason and Derry and Greg and Saruk for helping with these deployments. Um, this is really a culmination of their work um, that I'm presenting today. So um, just quickly, um, as a user, um, my proposal went in through the ARM um, M-sulficus. Um, and the goal here was to classify compounds by source type. Um, this is like biogenic, anthropogenic, biomass burning, and um, to identify novel chemical tracers indicative of specific chemical processes. For example, oxidation mechanisms, aqueous aerosol processing, and cloud aerosol interactions. And we do this by looking at very thorough chemical speciation of VOCs and aerosols. Um, and so um, at the SGP site last year, we were looking at things like daytime, nighttime differences um, and vertical resolution obviously achieved through um, flights on the TPS. Um, so on this, on these flights, we, um, I proposed to add on the frost sampler, which was really great because that allowed us to get sorbent tube analysis done at Sandia in Jason Salmon's laboratory with their two-dimensional gas chromatography with high resolution time of flight mass spec. Um, analysis. Um, and then I, there's other analyses that I had proposed to do that I won't talk about today, but I'll just kind of cover a quick highlight of a surface result um, that we used um, quartz and Teflon filter samples that were collected at ground level that I was able to analyze. Um, and that was done offline in our lab at UC Berkeley, also using two-dimensional gas chromatography. Um, and that specifically was to get at the semi-volatile um, aerosol species. Um, and then Greg already covered the um, NanoDesi HRMS result capabilities um, that we're also working on in collaboration. So um, for the frost VOC results, um, these figures are, um, coming up are all from Jason Salmon. Um, he prepared them and it's um, sort of a very quick overview of a few selected um, VOCs um, and they're sort of in a timeline um, which is plotted by chemical um, compound abundance or area signal on the chromatogram um, versus roughly by time or sample number. Um, and so you can see that in general, most of these um, compounds have abundance above the instrument flanks in the blue. Um, there was a fire influence on September 9th, which gives a lot of signal for a lot of compounds associated with that. Um, and then you have this variability of compound signal afterwards um, through sort of mid-September. And so I just selected a few alkane VOCs that I thought were interesting to show in terms of variability. Most of them are very high during the fire influence. Um, and then on the subsequent flights, you could see that there's sort of variation in these concentrations or these the abundance of these compounds um, over time. Some of them don't really show up past, um, um, past like a, a lot higher than the blank levels. Um, and so I think this actually is reflective of, for example, the C16 and C20 alkanes 
Um, they can come from plant waxes. So there's some sort of biogenic signals, but there are also some influence from the fire. Um, and so this is also reflective of photochemical um, fates and environmental um, fates that are different based off of these structures. Um, sort of more specifically, I pulled out a few tracers. Um, for example, phenol and benzyl alcohol in the left column, they are known biomass burning tracers. Um, so you can see that they're definitely high during the fire times. Um, they are also um, emitted um, in biogenics, but phenol can also be sort of an industrial byproduct. Um, but then looking at, for example, dimethyl sulfone, which is known to come from aloe and guava plants, um, it was high during the fire, but it also has sticks around after the fire day. Um, DEET, which many of you are probably familiar with applying as an insect repellent, we don't expect much of it to be in a fire, which makes sense, and it's sort of more um, sporadic and spikes associated probably with the anthropogenic activities, um, hopefully not just um, from operations at the site, but maybe more regional influence there. Um, and then there is benzene propane nitrile um, and nonanol. Um, benzene propane nitrile is known to be um, present from cabbage, broccoli, mustard varieties. Um, so I think this is indicative of the agricultural influence at the site, um, not at all, also from essential oils and citrus and pine plants. Um, and you could see that, of course, their um, compound abundance is a lot higher um, generally, and it's definitely higher than a day on a fire when we expect this to come from agricultural influence. Um, this is not, these plots are not plotted yet in terms of altitude, but it is, when you kind of really look into the um, samples, you can see that there is some sort of variation um, vertically resolved, and it's interesting to see what things can get kind of trapped aloft at higher concentrations compared to ground level, um, but that's sort of what I'm exploring further. And then just a quick case study from the SVOC results. Um, Darian mentioned September 13th um, at SGP, there was sort of this increase in POPs concentration in the evening. Um, there's also some smaller particle sizes um, developing at the third flight of the day. And I just looked really quickly at the surface level measurements from the SVOC measurements. Um, and you can compare this daytime chromatograph on the top, um, chromatogram on the top versus the nighttime chromatogram on the bottom. And what you, um, there's some differences daytime, nighttime, where you can see a decrease in signal between daytime um, in these, what would be more semi-volatile, more low volatility species um, during the daytime they're generated but then during the nighttime, they tend to be of lower signal. And then there's also higher volatility species showing up at the nighttime um, compared to the daytime. And so this might be sort of reflecting the fact that lower volatility species are participating in that OA formation and growth processes in sort of that late afternoon into the evening. And so there's a lot more data um, to be analyzed, a lot more compounds to be identified and traced from um, sort of traditional tracers and other novel tracers. Um, but that's still to come, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lindsay. Uh, with that, I think we can move on to Dan and Allison. Hi there, can you hear me, Derry? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, should I share my slides then? Sure. Okay, great. All right. Um, let me know. Uh, can you? Does that? Can you see that? Yep. Yes. Okay, great. Super. Thank you so much um, for the opportunity to present here today on a number of the uh, science opportunities that the um, the TBS observations at Sail have afforded. Um, this is a tag team effort between myself and Allison. I'm just going to give a little bit of a high level uh, perspective and talk about um, you know, some of the uh, non-aerosol related data streams and then uh, pass it over to, to Allison. Um, uh, this is an effort that um, uh, crosses uh, folks in the atmospheric science community down to um, folks who do surface and subsurface research, the watershed function SFA. Um, it's supported by uh, ASR and ARM, and I'm I'm just really appreciative of, of the the hard work, um, the the uh, the hard work across different seasons um, that uh, was was required to collect these data. Um, and and also, um, uh, as you can see on the on the bottom right here, 
um, the, uh, the the efforts of the graphic artist um, who uh, developed a sticker for sale that, that showed the TVS. Um, so that was a lot of fun too. Um, okay, so uh, let's just hop in um, here. Uh, the, the sale campaign, um, uh, I think, we're all sort of on the same page here, but just just in case um, for those of you who might not um, be super familiar with it, um, the uh, sale involved the um, the deployment of a of the uh, AMF two package to um, to an area near Crested Butte, Colorado, for uh, the better part of two years with uh, with dozens of instruments as part of the AMF two package. Um, there were also a number of really exciting uh, tethered balloon system deployments, um, which which added, um, I would argue, a whole other dimension to the sale campaign. Um, and and you know, so so we can see the uh, the, the the two main uh, sites from uh, fr from the AMF two package on the upper uh, right. Uh, on um, the, the 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 instruments were on a, a mount on Crested Butte Mountain. Um, at, a, at an elevated location and um, in, in Gothic on the lower right, um, where most of the most of the other instruments um, from from the uh, AMF2 uh, were located in a valley uh, location, um, and, and and we got to um, to really um, span you know um, uh, span elevational gradients um, as part of this campaign. Um, I wanted to show just a, a quick video uh, that was taken just to to give us a, a sense of of really the expanse of this area. Here, uh, Gothic Mountain and and the, uh, the the Gothic location, the center, the main facility from uh, AMF2. And um, we're circling around here and we're going to see, um, you know, down uh, down here and um, towards the the lower part of this valley is where the uh, the TVS uh, was deployed as part of sale, um, and um, and then we're going to circle back up towards uh, Crested Butte Mountain, and this over here is where we saw uh, the uh, the deployment of the um, of the uh, of of a, a number of the packages, the uh, aerosol measurements, uh, the measurements. Expand radar. There. Looks like Dan's having some trouble, Allison. I don't, do you want to <laughs> step in? Are you there? Hi, are you there? Yep. Now you're back. Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. I'm just um, at a uh, catch in Wi-Fi here, so so apologies. Um, did did. Uh, uh, did you see this slide? Where where did we cut off here? We did not see this slide. Okay, okay. I was just saying, yeah, sales science objectives uh, focused on precipitation, uh, uh, really understanding what this, the uh, spatial um, variability, the processes that drive that, uh, uh, winds, um, and then a number of aerosol um, processes uh, in the atmosphere and at the surface, and um, and then the surface energy balance. Um, so I wanted to um, to, to really uh, zero in on where the TBS data are very informative for these latter three objectives. Um, first, um, the uh, the deployment of a visible and thermal uh, camera was quite a uh, quite an opportunity uh, to to look at the side by side visible and thermal imagery, which really immediately reveal many land surface processes and atmospheric processes. Um, in the warm season, we can see that coniferous vegetation, for example, in this this side by side plot, coniferous vegetation remains cool, in spite of insulation. Uh, senescing deciduous vegetation does not. Um, you can see these uh, these aspen trees are 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 changing um, are changing colors, and their temperatures are quite a bit higher. And um, you can also uh, uh, use this to e estimate evapotranspiration uh, from land surface temperatures. So it's it's a it's a quite cool data set. 
Um, this, these, uh, these thermal and visible imagery were collected across many seasons um, as well. And so we can see, you know, in, in, this is a, a, a side by side um, in, the, uh, in the transition in the, the melt season here. Um, and, and we can see that um, the thermal env environment is highly heterogeneous. Um, it spans uh, freezing to well above freezing temperatures. Um, the vegetation is a whole lot warmer uh, than the snow in the spring, and then the clouds are a lot warmer as well. So that's a kind of a cool, a cool finding that immediately jumps out from those uh, those those pictures. Uh, we can also see uh, evidence of subsurface movement of heat. Here's a picture of the East River watershed. We can see that the the area around the river is a quite a bit colder um, and 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 well um, and well below freezing. And so so that's a kind of a, a cool result. We're we're still trying to unpack all of the all of the information about this. Um, this uh, this kind of bullseye plot uh, shows that uh, the emissivity of snow is anisotropic um, and um, and that's been calculated um, as has been hard to, to observe but we're observing it right here quite clearly um, and and it's uh, and the anisotropic anisotropic Anisotropicity is a function of snow grain size and impurities. Um, so that's that's a pretty cool result. Um, as we transition into the back into the warm season, uh, we can see just how much um, uh, cooler the vegetation is. Um, oopsies, uh, over here, uh, the vegetation is a lot cooler than the uh, non-vegetated surfaces, which can uh, be um, you know many many degrees Kelvin uh, warmer. And um, on the you know just. The, um, just a few days uh, difference, we can see a whole lot warmer. Um, you know, we're now 43, uh, cel 43, 44 Celsius. So, uh, so a lot, a lot of variability there to unpack. It's really exciting data set. Um, I also wanted to just, um, you know, give a shout out to the the atmospheric profiling of temperature, humidity, and winds. Um, that is is really exciting for testing um, the. Um, the representation of atmospheric boundary layers in complex terrain. Um, there's a, a, a well-established theory uh, for representing boundary layers um, on an Obakoff um, that, that works awesomely in Kansas and was developed um, and tested there. Um, and it doesn't work well in, in complex terrain. And, and people know it hasn't doesn't work well, and it's been used for 70 years, even in spite of that. Um, and with the TBS data, we're actually uh, measuring uh, nearly all the inputs and outputs of a boundary layer representation. Um, and oopsies, and so we can see, um, so this complex boundary layer is something we are really sampling quite uh, in, in quite a bit of detail. And so we're, um, you know, here's a, a picture of what these uh, lapse rates look like. Um, uh, at, at much higher frequency than we would normally get with a, with a radio sons. And, and we can see temperature profiles, wind speed, and water vapor mixing ratio profiles as they evolve across time um, from the, the TBS measurements. And they, they really show the diurnal evolution of the boundary layer um, exchange during the TBS deployments. Um, and uh, this plot on the right shows just how much room for improvement the current boundary layer uh, parameterizations have. Um, the um, the the blue lines um, show uh, what a what a model what is producing, and the uh, the the uh, the squares um, show and I'm uh, delighted to uh, to be looking into it. Um, so next steps, um, you know, we're looking at all of the things that we can do with the TBS data. Um, and we're going to be doing a, a lot more to geolocate the in imagery and do some diurnal analysis, uh, diurnal evolution analysis, and then transition to uh, aerosol process science. Um, and um, and so, yeah, there's a lot to do. And I, with that, um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them or just pass the baton to Allison uh, for her presentation. All right, I guess if there's no questions, um, I'm happy to get started. Does my screen um, look like it's in the correct mode? Yep, looks good, Allison. Excellent, I'm always worried about that. <laughs> okay, well, um, thank you everyone um, for staying on and, and thank you, uh, Derry, for hosting us. Um, and um, thank you, Dan, for giving a great introduction to SAIL so I don't have to spend a ton of time of that. I know that are running out of time, so I promise to be fairly quick. Um, but I wanted to talk to you a little bit about 
um, the TBS measurements that we collected during sale. This was also uh, one of the uh, FICUS awards um, from FY23. And there were, as you can see on this first page here, a lot of um, uh, collaborators involved. People from everywhere from the, the writing stage through the measurements and now the analysis stage. Um, so on the pictures there, you can just see some of um, some of our um, days where we were where Derry and her team were collecting data and the large variety in the um, seasons um, and also some of the instruments that um, are um, below the TBS in that middle picture. Okay, um, so we had a broad range of science questions within the SPICUS proposal since um, this uh, TBS deployment was uh, meant to largely complement the overall sale campaign. So we had a lot of very, um, pun intended, lofty goals. <laughs> so we wanted to understand how um, aerosols are impacting clouds and land atmosphere interactions. How are they um, interacting and impacting with surface energy? Um, where in the boundary layer are we seeing new particles or particle growth, um, transported layers, uh, scavenging, um, what's the impact of aerosols with storms and precipitation, and um, how we also had some other um, more specialized goals um, related to some of our collaborators, such as how do we quantify the contribution of atmospheric aerosols to plant nutrient assimilation, and um, also what are the processes that transport aerosols from long range uh, transport toward the surface for deposition. And you can see some of our images um, on a lot of those um, air. So, so I guess our, our uh, campaign was very aerosol focused, although as Dan mentioned, we do have the, um, the camera and the other um, kinds of measurements as well. But so those are our, our kind of um, images of our main um, aerosol interactions that we're looking at for this campaign. Um, like every uh, ARM campaign, there's a uh, website that you can go to to uh, just read our abstract, see everyone that's involved. If you want to um, contact us directly for any questions, um, our final campaign report has been submitted as of last month. Although um, as of today, I noticed that it's not linked yet, but hopefully should be sometime um, this month on this main page. Um, we uh, we asked for we asked for a lot of deployments, and we were super thankful to to get a lot. We got four sampling periods. The first one was right after winter storm in January, um, where the uh, concentrations were incredibly low. But um, we've been working with Emsel, and we'll still be able to get um, some interesting information out of those samples. Um, and then our second period was um, right before snowmelt was starting in April. Um, this is one of the other fun things about, um, you know, just typical field work and deployments. Like we we thought that that, that would be um, the beginning of snow melt and, and then period three would be peak snow melt, but everything was delayed this year. Um, and so the first one in April um, was pre-snow melt and the second one in the, in the um, spring was the start of snow melt in May. And then our last um, deployment was um, in the summer, uh, right at the tail end of um, the sail deployment. We have a total of 75 flights and you can um, either click on the QR code um, to uh, go to the campaign webpage or I also have a QR code later on. Can everyone still hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Allison. Okay, good. I got some weird Zoom error saying it had crashed. That's oh, no. <laughs> Okay, excellent. Um, so uh, yes, feel free to check out our website and contact us with any questions. Um, here's just an example. Derry talked about it a lot earlier on um, about an example payload. And then the additional measurements that we had for our campaign were um, we also are sharing some of the bulk filter samples um, for metals analysis that will be done by Lawrence Berkeley. And we also use the ice puck that Jesse talked about as well. The um, POPs data shown in the middle there is just showing you one of the interesting days um, where a, um, a biomass burning plume was actually sampled in um, one of the, um, a, a, as the balloon was coming down actually, and then later on when it went back up and down again, um, it was more dispersed within the boundary layer. And then there's a picture of the balloon aloft 
in June and a photo of one of the um, bulk filter samplers. Um, I think this was also shown a fair bit earlier, but um, thank you so much to Derry and the team who give us um, comprehensive reports um, every day on the data. And this is just an example of one of the days where um, three um, size selected filters were collected on the stack. And you can see that in the um, F1, F2, and F3, those are the different periods. And then on a couple of the different stages where some of them had a lot of uh, a high loading, um, which um, sometimes is not always great for EMSL depending upon their analysis, um, as, as well as a low filter loading. And so it's it's definitely an art that um, Daria and her team are, are doing as well as EMSL um, on the analysis side to kind of um, get get the uh, right amount of sample that that you need for the analysis. Um, quickly just showing some of the examples. Um, we are, as I mentioned, we just submitted our final campaign report and we also um, just maybe the month before that submitted our dates of interest to EMSL. So we're still very much um, working on this data analysis, but you can see on the left, some of the um, data from uh, Jay at EMSL um, showing different size distributions um, throughout uh, one day where in the afternoon, the um, particles were larger in the afternoon than they were in the morning. Um, they also were dominated by carbonaceous species, not surprising, but also interesting is that you can see peaking in at the bottom there, we also have um, some sodium rich and um, sulfate in our particles as well. And, um, just overall, what I wanted to say is that we have um, observed a lot of in interesting um, uh, processes during this campaign, including no new particle formation and growth, transport, the biomass burning phase. Um, I think we have, um, I know we have some post dust events and, and a lot of um, pre post storm events. Um, we're working with a lot of different collaborators on those different projects. And over on the right, um, some of the more detailed uh, chemical analysis from uh, Greg at Emsel, who, who spoke earlier as well. Um, we see evidence of um, SOA formation from both alpha pinene and isoprene. Only alpha pinene was pointed out on that one. Um, so in summary, just thank you to everyone um, for collecting these data sets. Um, Dan only very quickly mentioned, but um, Derry's team, <laughs> I don't know if this was one of, it had to be one of the most challenging. So. Um, Thank you for all the hard work to collect the data for us. And um, please contact me if you have any questions about um, really, I, I guess, anything about this data or um, even uh, for FIGUS proposals. So thank you. All right, thank you, Allison and Dan. And with that, I think we can move on to our last presenter, Maria. Thanks, Dari. Um, let me share my screen. And can everyone see my presentation now? Um, yep, Maria, but you're not in present presenter view just yet. Uh, what about now? Um, we're seeing your view with your notes, so I don't know if you can swap it. Oh, yep, this one? Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all so much for staying um, this long for this webinar. Um, it was an excellent webinar and I certainly learned a lot. So this is another FICUS campaign that was approved for um, the TBS deployments at sale. Um, I was the PI of this FICUS and together with Chong Ai Kwang and Olga Mayo Brasero from Brookhaven National Lab, we deployed um, some bioaerosol and coarse mold aerosol specific payload and the TBS, and we're also planning some additional MSO analysis. So the theme was uh, bioaerosols in the atmosphere, so the aerobiome associated with um, the Colorado Rockies. Um, so this was due to, performed during the sale campaign, so out of the preliminary material from um, that you just heard from Darren Allison still applies this here. Um, but we wanted to specifically investigate the vertical profiles of bioaerosol in the atmosphere um, because there is still a lot of uncertainty in both modeling and observational constraints of bioaerosols and their role in the atmosphere as, nu as ice nucleating particles. Um, we have deployed the instruments 
at the on the TBS platform uh, during the sale campaign during specifically the spring and summer 2023 deployments. So we weren't we weren't part of the TBS deployments in the winter as we would um, as for bioaerosols originate primarily from vegetation and soil and therefore um, snow cover would probably reduce our loadings. Um, uh, the specific TB, in situ TBS um, instruments that we deployed are um, an optical particle counter, um, which measures particle size distributions between nine, one and 30 micrometers, as we wanted to um, specifically get um, the counts of coarse mode aerosols, uh, which correspond to pollen, um, among other things. Um, and we also deployed a new instrument, which is a fluorescent portable optical particle sizer, or the FPOPs, which measures out of fluorescent particles between uh, 0.5 and 3 microns. Um, this is um, an instrument that's essentially a variation on the, on the familiar POPs instrument, but instead of its uh, regular diode laser, in this case, it had a, um, a UV diode laser which uh, excited out of fluorescence on a, in a subset of particles. And then um, we measured the fluorescence um, from the particles at a 90 degree angle. So, and here um, on the right-hand side, there is a plot of um, a signal, a test signal from this instrument, essentially from uh, various kinds of pollens. Um, so essentially, um, we measure out of fluorescence because a lot of biological, most biological aerosols will fluoresce um, due to the fact that they contain uh, proteins like tryptophan, which exhibit out of fluorescence. Um, a subset of non-biological particles also fluoresces, but um, it is up to us to use other measurements on TBS as well as MSO data to constrain only the biological particles. Um, some example data from uh, these deployments, this is some example TBS flights from um, uh, June 2023. Uh, here you see two vertical profiles collected both, um, uh, two sets of vertical profiles collected both on the TBS ascent and descent. And uh, we get the total particle signal from the non-fluorescent POPs instrument and the fluorescent particle signal from the POPs, the fluorescent POPs um, instrument on the TBS. So you can see that fluorescent particles account for a very small portion of total uh, particles in this um, 0.5 to 3 micron size range. We are still looking at all the profiles and identifying likely um, bioaerosol events. Uh, we will also, this year, we'll also do analysis at EMSO. And here is an image that uh, Jay has already provided me um, of some initial um, results. These are the, the, these are the same um, stack and T-back sample coll samples collected as Allison just mentioned right now. Um, and uh, we are further planning further analysis at EMSO. Uh, we're planning to look at particle size, morphology, and elemental composition. Um, and more specifically, we're look, planning to look at high resolution mass spectrometry using the NanoDesi platform in order to um, get the molecular composition of organic aerosol, but also start some biomarker identification um, through uh, examination of uh, high resolution mass spectral features, as well as some machine learning. And we are also for a specific set of samples that we're still uh, working on selecting. We are also interested in using the MSO ice nucleation platform. Um, I won't uh, take any more of your time since um, we are already short on it, but thank you so much to the ARM user facility. Um, obviously, Dari's uh, TBS team um, and the MSO staff and Brookhaven National Lab for internal funding for my time on this project. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Maria. 
Okay, well, I, I really appreciate everyone that presented today. Um, I know it takes some time to get these slides together, but I think it was really informative. I learned a lot too. <laughs> so thanks everyone that uh, participated. And yeah, if you have any questions, please reach out to anyone on the TBS team or anyone on the EMSL team. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Derry. I know we had a, some people that had to drop, so we will send out an email um, to the slides and recording from the webinar. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.